Hello and welcome to the NPTEL MOOCs course on Economics of Health and Education. In this uh, lesson 2 of the introductory week, uh, we will shift our attention to the two concepts of uh, human capital and human rights. Uh, there is a lot of uh, ascription to human uh, rights and human capital when we discuss about health and education and we will make an attempt to distinguish between these two uh, concepts in the form of conceptual frameworks which are used while discussing education and health. In the last class, we have already learned about the links of education and health to the concept of human development. Now, the uh, today's concepts of health uh, of human capital and human right, though related to human development, have distinct positions uh, when we are discussing uh, conceptual frameworks with respect to health and education. And therefore, it is important to devote one lesson uh, to these uh, conceptual frameworks. So, in uh, today's class, we will uh, discuss about a basic model of human capital investment. Uh, while doing so, uh, we will distinguish between uh, physical capital and human capital. Uh, we will uh, discuss whether investments in physical capital and human capital can be considered as the same thing or are there differences and because of the uh, distinguishing features of human capital, uh, what are the implications of uh, investments in human capital uh, or what are the implications of considering separate conceptual frameworks of human capital and human right in the context of education and health. Uh, while discussing uh, today's lesson, I will uh, take references to both education and health as the need arises. Uh, in the second part of today's lesson, we will discuss about uh, investments in health or what, what does it mean uh, when we say we look at health as a, also a form of human capital or contribution of health to human capital. Uh, finally, we will discuss about education and health within the conceptual framework of human rights and uh, in conclusion, we will discuss some of the key points. Now, let us begin with the foundational question of why people go to schools. Now, there are different uh, explanations to this foundational question, but when we are discussing economics of uh, education, uh, we can highlight two important responses to this question of why people go to schools. Uh, we can look at education as creation of minimum capabilities and education in, in, as investment in human capital. The notion of education as creation of minimum capabilities have been uh, adequately advanced by the ideas of uh, Amartya Sen through his uh, capabilities approach wherein Sen puts forward the idea of functioning or achieved functionings uh, which could uh, refer to various uh, things uh, notably the ability to read, calculate and process information so as to live a normal life with dignity. Uh, another important aspect that uh, responds to the foundational question of why people achieve education or why people go to schools is to look at education as investment in human capital and this is a notion that has also been sufficiently forwarded by various economists notably uh, Gary Becker and Theodore Schulz wherein they say that education can be looked at as some form of an investment in human capital. Now let us take this discussion further. In the context of education as creation of uh, capabilities, uh, Sen has in various ways advanced the idea that ownership of economic resource may not always generate utility because the ownership of economic resource uh, may not be able to extract the, the person owning these economic resources may not be able to extract benefits or utility out of those economic resources if the person is unable to process the information required to be, to be able to utilize the economic resource. In fact, the most famous example that Amartya Sen uses to explain this is the idea of a bicycle. So, I may possess a bicycle which is an economic resource, but I may not be able to utilize it because I am differently abled and, and, and therefore I am not able to utilize it or I may not possess the knowledge to be able to uh, utilize the economic resource. So, while I may be resource rich because I own a bicycle, but my inability to translate my economic resource into some form of functioning or utility may not provide me the utility that I desire out of that economic resource. So, ownership of an economic resource may not always generate utility. 
and this brings us to the necessity of understanding functionings why basic functionings are important and how these basic functionings give rise to the concept of capabilities and therefore creation of capabilities then becomes one of the important reasons as to why one must pursue education or why one must access be able to access good health facilities and so on so this brings in the necessity of functioning that helps individuals carry out ordinary business of life um, in the context of capabilities approach uh, apart from amartya sen various other authors have contributed to the idea of talking about expansion of capabilities and these capabilities range from the basic capabilities of being able to read and write and being able to exercise your voice about an opinion about various matters to complex kinds of capabilities as well uh we can take the example of simple capabilities such as of reading and computing that can help us perform um, such tasks of a normal social life such as finding a street address or enrolling our children in school reading instructions on a pack of medicine and so on so some level of education always creates additional utility but the important point that is being made here is to say that education as creation of capabilities means that education is intrinsically important and this is something that we have discussed in the last lesson as well a list of ordinary life acts that require some education in order to be performed uh, successfully are let's say using a public transport uh, checking a bill signing a check reading the instructions on electrical appliances etc the second view is that of looking at education as investment in human capital now basic capabilities can be acquired even with minimum education but often we experience that individuals choose to attain education beyond the minimum requirements so we choose to attain education beyond primary education beyond secondary education higher secondary education and therefore higher education so this is because education like that of health can also act as some kind of an investment good uh people make uh, smart investment decisions uh with regard to educational choices because they expect future returns if they continue to be in higher education for a longer period of time because uh, they might want to add on to their skills and therefore they expect to reap more benefits if they continue to be in education in the current period now in economics uh, when we think about buying a capital good today uh, we think about buying a capital good because it provides us some rate of returns in the future it helps us to earn rents but it is also associated with the idea of depreciation physical capital is always demanded up to a point where marginal productivity of that capital is equal to the additional cost that we are incurring on that capital now it is important to discuss uh, this conceptualization of physical capital because we are using the term capital with human capital uh, when we in the context of education and health now one approach is to look at education as a uh, commodity so to the question as to why do some individuals choose to continue education beyond minimum requirement uh, the the concept of human capital allows us to look at education as a form of commodity which can be demanded in the market but what is the what is the nature of this demand how much of it is to be demanded depends upon a lot of variables so people go to school because they enjoy acquiring knowledge and as i have just mentioned that the standard theory of utility maximization predicts that the optimal demand for education will be uh, will be determined at a point where the marginal utility of additional knowledge is just equal to the marginal disutility of giving up alternative uses of time involved to simplify this we can uh, say that you know we our optimal demand for education today would depend upon what is the additional utility that we are deriving out of gaining those years of education or gaining the extra knowledge associated with those years of education and compare it with the the opportunity cost that we are foregoing in terms of not being able to participate in the labor market today so we are foregoing wages if the utility if our expected utility is equal to the costs that we are foregoing during the current period then we would say that there is optimal demand for education but can the same be said for tertiary or higher education these are important questions that will help us conceptualize this idea of human capital 
Now, in the case of uh, tertiary uh, schooling or education, cost increases significantly when compared to secondary education without any evidence of increased pleasure in attending university lectures. So, uh, let me uh, simplify this further uh, for uh, the learner. Uh, let us say that uh, you know we demand higher education. I am demanding uh, an education, a technical education, which requires me to stay in education for a longer period of time beyond the specified age. Let us say I choose to be in education beyond the age of 25. Then what is it that is driving me to continue to be in education when uh, being in education for a longer period of time is not particularly pleasant because it would require a lot of hard work. It would require a lot of of uh, foregoing of opportunities that uh, will come to me if I am participating in the labor market. So, then can tertiary education or education that uh, is carried on uh, beyond a certain point be conceived of merely as a commodity? It is here that we can look at tertiary education choice as an investment decision where current income opportunities are foregone or renounced in exchange for better future income prospects. And this is equivalent to purchasing a production unit or a physical capital in order to obtain the rents associated with it in future. But the similarity ends here. We need to ask this question that is the analogy between investment in physical capital and human capital precise or are there differences? Can physical capital and human capital be traded in the market in, exa in exactly similar ways? This is where I would like to distinguish between the two concepts of human capital and uh, physical capital. Now, human capital uh, basically refers to the efficiency or the skills embodied within a human being. So, it is incorporated into human beings and cannot be uh, bought and sold separately like physical capital. Physical capital can be acquired at any uh, point of time in any desired amount in different periods of time during, uh, during recessions or in different markets. But human capital can be acquired mostly at the beginning of individual life. So, for example, if I am an individual who wants to participate in the labor market in future and if I want to be identified as a skilled workforce, I need to be in education for a sufficiently long period of time to be identified as a skilled workforce and not just be in education but acquire the kind of education that is demanded in the skilled marketplace. So, in that sense human capital has to be acquired at the beginning of individual life and if there are losses incurred for various reasons or if I am not able to participate in education in the beginning period of my life, then I am foregoing the opportunity of being identified as a skilled workforce or human capital. So, the pace of accumulation is determined by physiological factors along with various other uh, economic and social conditions and therefore human capital cannot be bought and resold like we do in the case of physical capital. So, this feature of human capital being embodied in human beings uh, gives rise to various kinds of market failures. For example, when taking a loan from the bank for physical investment, we often collateralize physical assets. But while taking educational loan, we cannot collateralize the incorporated knowledge which is embodied within human beings. And the second point is that there is a possibility of moral hazard in case of human capital, but not in case of physical capital. Let me explain this concept of moral hazard in the context of human capital a little more. The future benefits of acquiring education uh, now are conditional on exerting adequate effort in the labor market, but it is impossible to predict if the individual concerned will put that effort in the labor market in future or not. And this has important implications for parents who are investing in the current uh, duration of education as far as their children is concerned. So, in that sense, the current investment in education is riskier than any other financial investment, at least from the point of view of investing, uh, investing agents, that is parents. So, for example, if uh, we look at household as a firm and uh, the members in the household as taking decisions about uh, being in education in the current period because they expect higher returns uh, from uh, tertiary education 
if the demand for education or demand for number of years of schooling in the current period is high. Now, although parents as investors within the family might want to spend on the tertiary education of the child or the children concerned, there is no guarantee that the children will be able to participate adequately uh, in the labor market in future. And this is exactly what is referred to the concept of moral hazard in the context of education. So, the future benefits of acquiring education now are conditional on exerting adequate effort in the labor market which cannot be guaranteed. Finally, an owner of physical capital has some degree of control over it. They may be a bona fide capitalist or rentier and they may uh, want to draw income from the capital or rent from the property in future. But an educated person who owns the human capital or in other words, an educated person whose knowledge is embodied within the human being cannot employ it in a production process unless hired as a dependent worker himself or herself. In which case then the individual becomes a wage earner. So, the individual himself for herself is a commodity uh, that uh, is commodified uh, that whose knowledge has to be bought and resold in the market for a wage. So, human capital does not command the same market power as does physical capital. It is important to make this distinction between human capital and physical capital as we move on in this course on economics of health and education because um, uh, it is this uh, uh, it is this characteristic of human capital that makes that that has uh, severe implications uh, for the uh, demand and supply of human capital in the labor market. Now, based upon uh, this idea of uh, the imprecise uh, similarities between physical and human capital, we can actually talk of a basic model of human capital investment. The uh, standard model of human capital investment argues that each individual will acquire education up to a point where the cost of acquiring that education that includes both direct and indirect monetary costs equals the benefit of acquisition or the utility of acquisition which is the uh, expected value of the earnings uh, in the future. Now, this means that there are two obvious conclusions to that. One is that more talented people or people who expect their returns to education will be higher in the future because they have better talent or they may be able to acquire better skills, they may be able to utilize their skills better in the future if they acquire uh, the higher education or the technical education and so on is an important factor of demand for education. And this is what we refer to as uh, the uh, skills of human beings or human capital creation in the current period because of education and training and so on. We will devote a separate lesson to uh, human capital uh, model as the course progresses. Uh, but in this lesson, we are simply making a distinction between the concepts of human capital, physical capital and then uh, positing it against the conceptual framework of human right. So, coming back to uh, this uh, slide, as I mentioned, the standard model of human capital uh, talks about uh, uh, costs and returns and there are two uh, basic uh, implications of uh, this idea. One is that more talented people will always demand more education because they expect that their returns to education will be higher in the future. And second is that the demand for education is higher when the future expected gain is higher relative to the current earnings. So, we can uh, bring in a visualization of this uh, uh, model. Let me introduce you to this model here. The x axis uh, shows the education or the years of schooling. This is the x axis here. And uh, the y axis shows the costs of acquisition of education. Uh, the uh, notice that the uh, marginal cost of uh, education acquisition has a y intercept. This is what is referred to as the non monetary costs of education. So, you have a cost schedule which is upward sloping and it depicts increasing costs for higher levels of education, even upward sloping marginal cost of uh, education acquisition or acquiring higher education. And then you have a demand for uh, education which is known as the marginal returns to education. It is determined as marginal returns to education which is downward sloping and is convex. Um, so, in this uh, graph what we are showing is suppose an individual is optimally choosing the amount of education E1. Uh, corresponding to the intersection of marginal cost with marginal benefit at uh, point A. 
so uh, this 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 is the point where the individual is choosing an optimal amount of education but if that individual uh, expects that in the next period there will be an increase in demand for skilled labor because of changes in the economy's condition or because of the way technology is advancing in the current period then uh, given the uh, talent that the individual has or the skills that the individual expects can acquire in the current period she may expect a, a higher returns to education in which case the marginal returns to education will shift outward and the optimal uh, education that is demanded in the current period will also rise from e1 to e2 so in other words the individual might want to spend more years uh, in uh, schooling this is a very simple model of how a human capital investment model looks like to um, explain the graph better in the uh, previous graph you saw a visualization where the cost schedule is shown uh, which includes both monetary and non monetary costs of achieving higher levels of education uh, you have a downward sloping uh, returns schedule or we can say a demand curve which uh, shows the demand uh, for education um, in the uh, education market and the x axis shows the time devoted to uh, education or other words the years of schooling this uh, figure helps us to understand why different individuals demand different amounts of education and if one person has uh, more talent which is referred to as unobservable ability in uh, economics here then individuals may experience a higher marginal return for any portion of time invested in education so um to conclude the first part of the lesson here what we have discussed is that there are different uh, views of uh, looking at um, the foundational question of why people acquire education for that and a similar kind of a discussion can be held as to why uh, people uh, demand uh, better health conditions because health also has an important interlinkage with increasing in productivity Uh, in this part we have seen that uh, there are uh, two basic explanations as to why people attain education one is because it is intrinsically important or education has intrinsic value and therefore we are talking about education as creation of human capabilities uh, which leads to uh, different kinds of functionings which may ultimately provide use value to the individuals um but also education has instrumental value education can be viewed as commodity that provides utility um and particularly in the context of higher education where uh, an individual has to make a decision of uh, demanding uh, education and what is the optimal choice that the individual has to make it depends upon the expected returns to education that an individual can acquire in the current period and the benefits that the uh, individual can acquire from this education in the future period which is uh, which is the standard utility maximization framework that is used uh, to explain the human capital investment model of um, education now in this second part uh, we have now come to the second part of this lesson in this second part i will discuss about um held as human capital now i would like to take a reference to the world development report of 1993 which uh, sufficiently uh, popularized the concept of investing in health or uh, understanding health as human capital although health as human capital is a concept has been discussed uh, in various ways uh, since uh, uh, the 1970s and the 1980s but the report of world development in 1993 took this idea further with reference to the who global burden of disease study and the world development report of 1993 made some specific recommendations for the indian context the report proposed a three pronged strategy uh, to ensure uh, investments in health looking at taking the framework of health as human capital now there are three uh, uh, strategies that were proposed one is fostering an environment that enables households to improve health so here uh, the idea is that uh, it is households that often make the decision 
regarding uh, the uh, health of its individuals or the health of its family members um, but then uh, at, at the, the whether the at the macroeconomy level there are certain conditions that can be enablers of the household decision for provision of health uh, better health conditions at the household level the second was improving government spending on health uh, which is also couched in this framework of health as human capital and finally promoting diversity and competition and how that also contributes to the um, human capital nature of health let us look at each of these uh, uh, strategies that were proposed by the world development report in the context of india as i just mentioned that uh, if we if we consider households as firms or households as producers of health of their family members then household decisions shape health but often these decisions that are taken place at the household level have constraints and often these constraints are in the form of incomes or the education of the household members so in addition to promoting overall economic growth governments can improve these decisions household decisions if they pursue economic growth policies that will benefit the poor and that would include uh, necessary adjustment policies uh, that preserve cost effective health expenditure now while i am making uh, uh, discussing these strategies that were proposed by the world development report i must also point out that these strategies were highly contested in the indian context uh, because the uh, human capital framework that the report used to identify the decisions that need to be taken at the macroeconomic level did not necessarily align with the uh, conceptualization of health as human rights and therefore the contestation however i am pointing out these strategies to clarify this concept of uh, human capital uh, framework further second is expanding investment in schooling ensuring that uh, investment in schooling uh, is increased particularly for girls so that more and more girls come into education which also has implications uh, for uh, the household taking decision about health and education in the future promoting rights and status of women through political and economic empowerment and legal protection against abuse now the idea about fostering an environment uh, in the form of uh, appropriate economic growth policies is to ensure that the there are uh, implications for uh, health and education for the future generation and in that context this contributes to the idea of human capital fostering the right environment so that uh, adequate decisions are taken at the uh, micro level at the household level as well as at the macro economic level what uh, steps the governments need to take also adds to the idea of uh, human capital or how uh, the contribution to human capital the second strategy was to improve government spending the report acknowledged that the challenge for most governments is to concentrate resources on compensating for market failures and efficiently financing services that will particularly benefit the poor um and uh, therefore uh, the report suggested that uh, to reduce government expenditures on uh, tertiary facilities or uh, higher health facilities uh, specialist training and interventions that provide little health gain for the money spent uh, now uh, here i would like you to uh, understand these strategies uh, slightly critically uh, because this idea of investing in health uh, includes a trade off between providing basic services and uh, neglecting uh, higher services that may also have importance for the economy uh, it is in this context that the world development report suggested to implement package of public health interventions uh, to deal with substantial externalities and uh, this these packages of public health services that is advanced based upon the idea of human capital investments was highly contested and continues to be contested in the context of uh, developing countries such as india uh, because it does not necessarily align with the concept of social justice or does not align with the concept of equality or equality of access and equality of opportunity as far as health and education is concerned finance and ensure delivery of a package of essential clinical services improve management of government health services uh, through decentralization and contracting out of services now as you would notice 
uh, if you uh, look closely at some of these uh, strategies that were uh, suggested by the world development report it actually uh, talks about efficiency measures uh, so that human capital investment or investing in uh, health uh, can be viewed through the narrow prism of what are the returns to the economy uh, based upon the current investments that are made on health and there is no mention about uh, uh, which are the sections of whether it is reaching all sections of the population equitably or not. Finally, promoting diversity and competition, government finance of public health and of a nationally defined package of essential health clinical services would leave the remaining clinical services to be financed privately or by social insurance within the context of a policy framework established by the government. Uh, again, I would like you to look at this uh, the, at these points critically uh, because when we talk about investments in health, um, uh, it uh, basically means that uh, you know efficiency has to be achieved and for efficiency to be achieved there will be some trade-offs uh, uh, because uh, uh, raising of resources for investing in health would mean that um, somebody has to be worse off to make someone better off. Uh, so, in that sense uh, these strategies also called for uh, financing of health services through social insurance or financing of health services uh, through private players within the uh, existing government setup. But this is how it emphasizes that governments can promote diversity and competition in provision of health services. In other words, it does not just make the governments obligated to provide healthcare services, it uh, impresses upon the government to create an environment so that other players including the private players who have a profit motive can also be invited into this scene to provide uh, healthcare services. So, it mentions encourage social or private insurance for clinical services outside the essential package, encourage suppliers both public and private to compete to deliver clinical services and provide inputs such as drugs to publicly and privately financed health services. Domestic suppliers should not be protected from international competition. Uh, it also mentions generate and disseminate information on provider performance on essential equipment and drugs on the costs and effectiveness of interventions and on the accreditation status of institutions and providers. Let me summarize this second part of the lesson to you. Uh, in the second part of the lesson, I took the reference to World Development Report on Investing in Health uh, with the idea that the human capital framework was utilized to propose strategies of uh, health interventions, particularly in the context of India, wherein we saw that the idea that uh, decisions for health is taken at the household level was given primacy. Uh, which means that it is the obligation of the households to take decisions about their health conditions because it improves productivity at the household level and therefore it gives the primary responsibility of taking health decisions to the households. Second is that the governments uh, can take proactive policy decisions so as to ensure that there are enabling conditions for the households to take the required health decisions at the household level. Now, how can the governments improve uh, these conditions? The governments can improve conditions by following proactive economic growth policies but identified which are those domains that need uh, immediate attention and relegating the other sectors for other players such as the private players or paying attention uh, at a later phase. So, for example, in this case the WDR, the World Development Report emphasized upon providing primary healthcare services, uh, ensuring that basic clinical services are available, uh, postponing the uh, training required for specialist services and so on and so forth and this was based upon the uh, global disease burden study wherein it was found that uh, countries such as India, the poorer countries were still suffering from infectious diseases and there and given the uh, resource envelope of uh, these countries or the resources available for use for these countries, it was made imperative to focus on select services so that there can be an immediate impact on the human capital formation of the country that will also impact productivity of the country.
Let us move to the uh, final part of this lesson where I discuss about health and education as a uh, human right. Now, before I can go uh, ahead with this discussion on health and education uh, within the conceptualization of human rights, I must point out to the learners that uh, the conceptualization of human right is deeply rooted in philosophical foundations and there are various uh, discussions, there are various uh, schools of thought uh, surrounding the theoretical uh, conceptualizations of human right. However, it is not possible to uh, delve into the philosophical foundations of of uh, human rights concept in this uh, course. Therefore, I am making reference to some of the key points as to why when we discuss about availability of health and education facilities or when we discuss about accessibility to health and education facilities, we take reference to whether they qualify as human rights or not. The second important point is that uh, the reason why we need to discuss and distinguish uh, the uh, health and education as human right versus human capital is because there are profound implications of such conceptualizations. Whether we adhere to the conceptualization of health and education only as human capital or whether we uh, adhere to the conceptualization of health and education as human right has severe implications with respect to expenditure or public expenditure on health and education and therefore the emphasis on uh, conceptualization of human rights. Now, there are various aspects uh, that come into play when we consider health and edu education within the rights perspective. I would like to highlight three important points. First is the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which outrightly mentions that uh, right to, about right to education and right to health. Article 26 makes education a human right. Article 25 makes health and well-being a human right. It also talks about right to a standard of living which is adequate for health and well-being. And therefore, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights uh, unambiguously establishes education and health as fundamental human rights internationally recognized. And as long as uh, we are adherents to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, I mean if there are governments that are adhering to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, it is obligated upon the governments to ensure that access and availability of education and health is made for all. And this brings the point of non-discrimination. We often talk about equality of opportunities. Equality of opportunities is, uh, is guaranteed because of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. There are two important points with regard to non-discrimination. One is of course that access to health and education should be free from discrimination irrespective of race, gender, age, economic status or any other criteria. Second is that there is equality of opportunity in accessing these services. The state or anyone cannot deny accessing these services to any section of the population based upon any social identity. And the interrelated aspect of these two, the fact that these are human rights and that there should be non-discrimination, it makes it is a state obligation. It is obligated upon the governments to protect, respect and fulfill these human rights and this includes creating laws and policies that facilitate access to education and health care. And here you would immediately see that uh, in principle the conceptual fabric of human capital as investment and human capital as human right and health and education as human capital and health and education as human right is with respect to the implications that it has on how we view these specific aspects of human life, whether we uh, want to look at, look at them as commodities um, that have instrumental value alone or whether we want to look at them as uh, something which is intrinsically important and not just intrinsically important, it is intrinsically important as a matter of right and inalienable right and therefore uh, uh, not necessarily co connected to the, uh, the uh, idea of ability to pay. So, I may not have the ability to pay for my education or my health but the fact that it is universally declared as a human right means that the state is obligated to ensure that I have access to my health and education. So, what is the difference um, held as human right and held as human capital? Now, there are a few points that needs uh, to be highlighted. Uh, when we talk about held as human rights, 
we are arguing from an ethical and moral ground with the belief that every person inherently deserves health care and the focus here is on the inherent dignity and worth of every individual irrespective of their social identity. And as I mentioned, uh, these two uh, points have important policy implications because then governments and societies are obligated to provide healthcare services guided by the principles of universality, equity and non-discrimination. And therefore, there are outcome goals. The goal is to achieve universal health coverage and equitable health outcomes for all. If any of you has been following the recent health policies in India, you would see that most uh, countries across the world are uh, committed to the idea of universal health coverage, which means that we have moved from the idea of looking at health only as a human capital or only having instrumental value to considering health as a human right. Similarly, in the case of education, if you have had the chance to follow the sustainable development goals, if you have had the chance to look at the earlier millennium development goals and so on, you would see that most of the international commitments to uh, development identifies education and health as human right, which means that they have to be provided by the governments as a matter of social justice. But when we look at health as human capital, also education as human capital, it is guided by the economic foundation that they are assets or investments that improves productivity and therefore the economic foundation of uh, these, uh, these uh, important aspects of human life, health and education as human capital is completely silent about whether they are a human right or not. All we are concerned about is, is whether it improves productivity in the short run and in the long run. So then the focus of health as human capital is the economic value of maintaining and improving health as healthier individuals are more productive. We are not uh, paying attention to whether it is a right or not, but we are paying more attention to the economic uh, value of uh, health because it is connected to the idea of productivity, work productivity and therefore earnings. And of course, this has policy implications as well because then if investments in health is analyzed for their return on investment, uh, it will require you know, decisions to be taken with regard to uh, whether the government should be spending only on preventive health care or promotive health care, whether on education about health, interventions that reduce incidence of chronic diseases. It is a matter of choice for the government depending upon what are the health outcomes that the governments are expecting or are uh, trying to pursue. So, the outcome goals in this case, the primary goal is to maximize economic productivity and efficiency and therefore health in initiatives are valued based on their ability to enhance workforce productivity and reduce absenteeism and healthcare costs. Uh, so, you would immediately see from these differences that the conceptualization of health as human capital or education as human capital is restrictive, is, uh, is not as uh, promotional as in the context as we um, can see in the case of health as human rights. So, the key differences, one is ethical versus economic rational. Health as a human right is driven by ethical considerations, arguing that it should be a universal entitlement. But in contrast, the human capital approach is driven by economic rationale, viewing health primarily as a means to enhance productivity. Secondly, universal access versus economic efficiency. The human rights perspective emphasizes universal access to health services as a matter of justice and equality. Uh, the human capital perspective focuses on economic efficiency. It talks about trade-offs. It talks about where to spend more, where to spend less, what can be done more in the current period, what can be postponed to the future period and the strategic allocation of resources to therefore optimize health related returns. And finally, intrinsic versus instrumental value, health as a right or education as a right values health intrinsically as something valuable in itself and health as human capital values health instrumentally for its ability to contribute to economic productivity. Now, in the context of India, uh, you must have seen that uh, for, during the period of the uh, middle 2000s, there was a lot of movement towards uh, rights based approaches to development where we uh, introduced right to education, uh, we introduced right to information, we introduced right to work, right to uh, health and so on and so forth. Now, in the Indian context, 
education and health are viewed uh, not just from the narrow prism of a human capital approach but from the broader vision of human rights approach and therefore uh, you would see in successive budgets there is a lot of importance and emphasis laid to provision of education and health to all sections of the population so if i have to ask you the question is health a human right yes it is a human right is health a form of human capital investment yes it is a form of human capital investment but can health be seen only as an investment no good health is more than an investment it is also a human right and therefore health particularly public health is a global public good uh, this is a concept which we would uh, study uh, as we progress in the course however i would like to end this lesson with this um, uh, slide where i want to point out that when we talk about um, education or health as a commodity uh, and if we have to look at a matrix of what kind of commodities you would uh, see that often we discuss about the uh, public finance aspect financing aspects of health and education where we define public health or public education or basic health and basic education in the matrix of uh, public goods something which is non excludable so my consumption of basic education will have beneficial impacts not just for myself but for others in the society similarly my consumption of basic education uh, is not rival in the sense that if i am consuming basic education it does not make uh, education less available for someone else so in that sense it is identified as a public good and uh, when we have when we are trading public goods within the economy it necessitates governments to intervene because the benefits have far reaching impacts on different sections of the population and uh, because it is co-consumed or consumed together by various sections of the population not everybody will reveal their preferences as to uh, who should pay for these goods and therefore it should be provided free of cost which is why you see uh, most government schools provide primary education secondary education free of cost um, because it is considered as some form of a uh, public good now i also since in the last lesson we discussed about the interlinkages of health and education with the concept of human development i want to end week 1 uh, by again requesting your attention to the concept of human development because this concept of human development provides us a framework to understand and measure health achievements as a human right and human capital investment human development as a concept integrates both of these concepts and it serves as a conceptual yardstick to theorize about how should investments in health be studied um and similarly with education therefore um in currently in the international uh, uh, scenario uh, in the, in the context of international frameworks uh, uh, the human development framework is a very useful framework that uh, not only looks only at the human capital conceptualization but also pays equal attention to the human rights uh, conceptualization or framework and based upon these conceptualizations we have uh, human development index which is a measure of human progress we also have multi dimensional poverty index which is a measure of human progress um so therefore um as i have just concluded that human uh, capital and human rights both these conceptualizations are important in the context of uh, education and health and because uh, both of these conceptualizations are ascribed to discussions around education and health it is often uh, difficult to uh, apply the standard neoclassical framework to uh, trading of um, health and education in the uh, marketplace and uh, we uh, make use of uh, heterodox economics to understand the implications of uh, um, of uh, of interventions in health and education which we will focus on as we progress in this course these are a few references that i have used for this lesson uh, the learners are uh, requested to uh, get these references these are easily available uh, online and uh, there is a link that i have provided in this reference if you want want to understand the uh, role of uh, Uh, world bank and the role of uh, world development report in uh, in formalizing these concepts of human capital it will help you understand better 
For the more enthusiastic learner, I have also compiled a list of resources. Uh, now, these resources uh, I will not be covering as a part of this course. However, if you are interested to delve deeper into this concept of human rights and human capital, you are um, encouraged to follow these references. I have compiled just a few uh, for your benefit. Uh, for example, Health and Human Rights, a reader. This book is a collection of foundational texts that explore the link between human health and realization of human rights. It addresses the implications of health related rights and provides an analysis of how health disparities and policies relate to human rights. Uh, so, this is an interesting uh, uh, reading uh, for those interested to um, delve deeper into these connections. Similarly, Education as a Human Right, the Principles for a Universal Entitlement to Learning. Uh, this book examines education as fundamental human right and explores the principles that should guide its realization. It provides us a look at how education systems can be designed to meet human rights standard globally. Um, there is a book uh, titled Just Health, Meeting Health Needs Fairly by Norman Daniels. This book also uh, reasons why health should be considered as a special kind of human right. Later in this course, we will look at uh, health as a special kind of uh, good, um, economic good. Uh, this book talks about why health is considered as a special kind of human right, focusing on fairness in health and health care. And Daniels also offers a framework for assessing health systems and health policies from a justice perspective. Uh, similarly, there is this book on the right to health at the public uh, private divide, a global comparative study. This is a very interesting study that explores the right to health within the context of tensions between public and private healthcare sectors. And uh, this book is um, uh, relevant in the current period where uh, there is a lot of tension uh, with respect to uh, health policies, um, particularly in the wake of uh, pandemics, the global pandemic that we have experienced. Uh, and this book provides a global overview and case studies on how the right to health is interpreted and implemented in various countries. Inequity in Education, a Historical Perspective. Uh, this uh, a book is a collection of essays that provides historical insights into disparities and challenges within education systems and discusses the implications for viewing education as a human right. Um, there is a book uh, titled Rights Based Approaches to Public Health. Uh, which uh, explores how rights based approaches can be effectively utilized in public health. It includes case studies and practical examples to demonstrate the application of human rights principles in health initiatives. In another class, I will introduce uh, some uh, Indian books on uh, textbooks and uh, uh, writings on uh, some similar issues which will help the learner to contextualize these discussions in the context of India. So, with this uh, we will end week 1. Uh, in the next week, uh, we will discuss about the microeconomic foundations of health and education. We will discuss some of the microeconomic concepts uh, that will help us to understand the demand and supply uh, of, of and for health and education better. Thank you. Mm -hmm.